what exactly is the status of the barred subject vis-a-vis -vis the barred other? So far, the bumper sticker we've been working on is, I am what the barred other lacks, but it is not what I lack. And that non-reciprocal superimposition of lack is a relevant one. It's a useful one for us to hold in mind. I am what the barred other lacks. I, as a barred subject, is what the barred other lacks. But what I lack is not a barred other. In fact, I'm surrounded by barred others day in and day out. <clears throat> That's the nature of being human. Here's another question. To what extent does the position of the barred subject in the topology of the subject with which we're working point to the absolute subject of enjoyment, as Lacan refers to it in chapter 9, around page 4, I believe. Now, I'm not entirely convinced that these two things are going to sync up, but he raises it as a question. He invites us to wonder about this. One of the phrases he uses here that might be relevant for this question is to talk about the one before the one. It's kind of a confusing moment in these middle chapters. When he talks about the one before the one, what exactly is he after here? Two different ones. There is the one of jouissance, the one of enjoyment, that is prohibited. And this could be the jouissance one that you may have heard Jacques-Alain Miller talk about. This is an individualized, hyper-embodied, auto-erotic, singularly actualized form of jouissance. Getting back to the basic understanding that we have of enjoyment, which is it's always particular, it's always private, and it's always your own. I can help you enjoy, but I can't enjoy for you, and vice versa. You can be involved in the production of my enjoyment, but only I am the one who gets to enjoy. It very much connects Lacan to existential traditions, which can be summed up pretty quickly around whether someone can take a bath for you. The other one, though, the one after the one here, this would be the oneness of the big other, the oneness that the big other seeks, the oneification as an operational aim of the big other. Here, it would not be about singularity, in the sense of jouissance one, but it would be about collectivity, a universalization, remembering what we mean by unus here. So the one before the one would not be about oneness, but about singularity at the level of one singular body. And this might suggest that we're on the path to the absolute subject of enjoyment. The one after the one, this would be the one that the big other seeks, that the barred other always is just shy of. Here, it wouldn't be about a singular embodied identity, but a collective, and I would even say virtual, identification. Here's another question to add to our list here. How exactly does repetition fit in here? You've heard me say it before, repetition is a key concept for Lacan here in the mid-late 60s, and it pops up again here in chapter 12, as we're going to see in a moment. How exactly does repetition participate in the topology of the subject that we're working with in seminar 16? Now, obviously, the iterative topology of the subject that we've drawn where each topology becomes a new S2 in a new version of the same topology, which in turn becomes an S2 in a new version of the same topology, you can see an infinite repetitive cycle being played out there. You'll also note in the first diagram that we developed in this series, the circular diagram. In the lower left-hand part of that, you see repetition, where surplus jouissance, is marked as a repetition of the imaginary relation we have with the phallus, with an original supply. So supply and surplus are linked up by way of repetition. And that's really what that first diagram is demonstrating, is that as you transition from one element to the next, you see a different function, a different operation occurring. 
And that connection between surplus jouissance and uh, the phallus is, is important here because it is also one marked by repetition. What the object of surplus jouissance repeats, if you will, is an imaginary relation to objects not unlike that which we experienced in pre-edipal, pre-linguistic imaginary triangles. But again, here we are, looking at this topology of the subject and wondering yet again, is there another way that repetition might factor in to some of the work that we're doing? And I think the answer is yes. Check out how Lacan sets us up for this. Chapter 12, page 11. <clears throat> and you'll note there's some good stuff in the middle of this chapter 12. We don't need to talk much about it. It's stuff that we've already discussed in many ways, but it's interesting to note what Lacan is doing here. So on page nine, he basically takes on idealism and shows that psychoanalysis is different because it does not place thought in some internal cognitive noumenal circuit at the level of the individual, something properly psychological, the way that Kant and the idealist tradition after him effectively did. It's no coincidence that Kant is coming up here on page nine. He says psychoanalysis is doing something different. It's not psychological in an idealist fashion, but instead sociological. And it's a properly, in fact, sociolinguistic enterprise, not about the individual internalization of thought, but instead the way that thought is distributed across a differential system, a differential system of signifiers that make subjects possible, that make interiors possible, that condition the very thinking subjects that German idealism would take as foundational. What idealists understand as foundations, in other words, Lacan is going to realize as effects. They're effect structures. Anyway, moving on. Page 10, he's doing stuff with symptoms and signifiers. Terrific. He's also working in set theory. And anytime Lacan makes a shift to set theory, rest assured he's going to trot out some big ideas, some key ideas. For him, set theory is really a touch point in mathematical thought. And that's exactly what he's working here. He's using set theory very glancingly to talk about, in a mathematical way, the differential system of signifiers known as language, that same differential system that produces the subject, thinking and otherwise. On page 11, he hits us with what is now a very familiar theme. The big other does not exist. He talks about, in the middle of the page, a configuration of signifiers, which in no way signifies that the entire configuration, that the universe thus constituted, can be totalized. So you can have a differential system, a configuration of signifiers, but this does not way, in any way indicate that this configuration can be universalized, can be made into a universe, contained, in other words, or as he puts it here, totalized. What he's saying here is the same thing he's been saying about knowledge, is that it is effectively incomplete and because it's incomplete, also effective. But it can never be whole. There is no such thing as omniscience, and thus the big other is designed to fail. The big other doesn't exist, but the barred other does in its pursuit of totality, a um, fruitless pursuit. In fact, Lacan wants to add here quite the contrary to this totalization. It leaves outside the field as not being able to situate as one of its parts, but only articulated as an element in reference to others, the sets thus articulated. So there's always something that's being left out from this totalizing effort. And this has been one of the major topics that we've been working on here. Remember, the spirit of this, the spirit of our turn in chapter 12, is to take stock and kind of look back, anticipate where we're going, and try and understand where the hell we are. That's how he opens this, and that's in the spirit that we're operating. On page 11 of chapter 12, we also get something new, though. And that's why I call your attention to this page. Last paragraph on page 11. 
this minimal logical structure, now remember, the minimal logical structure of language that Lacan has in mind is an S1 and an S2, a signifier and another signifier. The minimum signifiers required to have the differential systematics, known as language, are two. You have to have at least two. Now, of course, you're going to have many, 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 many Googleplex more, but you have to have at least two. S2 is fundamentally a binary signifier, not because it's bifurcated, as you know, even though it is, <laughs> but because it, is, it exists as the second of two signifiers that mark a system as differential. <clears throat> so when he says here at the bottom of page 11 that he's looking for the minimal logical structure, he's looking at that S1 and that S2. You have to have at least two entities to have a differential system. Now what we know, and it doesn't even bear repeating here, so I might just leave it out, oh never mind, I'll just go ahead and say it one more time, is that where two or more have gathered, you always have a third. The third is the differential relation between them, what eventually Lacan will go along to call a non-rapport of sorts. Here though, it's a differential relation that marks a third element in this set comprised of at least two. So what we could accurately, more technically say is that the minimum logical structure is not a binary system with two elements, but a trinary system, if you like that, because there's always the relationship, the differential relationship itself between the two elements that allow them to remain distinct and phenomenologically separate and identifiable as two elements. Now you've heard me go over this again, so we'll leave it at that. The minimal logical structure here, three elements we've said, as it is defined by the mechanisms of the unconscious, I have for a long time summarized under the terms of difference and repetition. Now I hesitated to bring up the virtual earlier because I know a lot of folks who watch this series are also keen on Deleuze. I get about an email a week from somebody asking if we're going to ever do a series on Deleuze. Uh, years ago, yes, we did it. Um, I don't know if that's in our future, even though Deleuze has some great stuff. And Deleuze is important because he figures largely in Lacan's thought at this point. You see, in the 50s, Lacan has a different set of peers. I would argue that here in the 60s, especially the late 60s, the peer that Lacan often has in mind when he's operating is Deleuze. Deleuze comes up explicitly in this section, um, and there's some great secondary scholarship on Lacan's relationship to Deleuze and, and, and the times that they got together, one time in particular, apparently, um, but we'll leave that uh, to, to, the, to the experts on this instead. Uh, my friend Dan Smith has some pretty good stuff on this. You should check it out. But back to that minimal, logical structure here. Under the terms of here it comes, Deleuzeans, difference and repetition. He says he's been saying for a long time that what he's doing with language can be summarized under the terms of difference and repetition. Nothing else grounds the function of the signifier except its absolute difference. It is only in the way that the other signifiers are different from it that the signifier is sustained. So here's that important element about the differential production of meaning in the field known as language. And just recall the example again of looking up a word in the dictionary. When you look up a word in the dictionary, you find other words that are different from the word you looked up, but are themselves also integral to understanding the meaning of the word that you looked up. So in order to understand what the word you looked up means, in other words, you have to also understand its differential yet connected relationship with all these other words. And the same thing would happen if you went and looked up those words, the words that were in the definition of the original term that you looked up. You'd find other different words. And that whole differential system, it's a system of absolute difference, Lacan says. It's the only way that one signifier can be maintained in its meaning, namely in differential relation to another. And now here's the second part of difference and repetition. On the other hand, 
These signifiers should be and function in a repetitive articulation. And here you might say that we move a little bit away from Deleuze and maybe more into some Derridian insights, perhaps insights that even flowed from uh, Lacan's work. I'm sure Lacan would have us think that. Language here, in other words, for Lacan, and this is going to become important as we think about the topology of a subject, is a differential system whose constitutive elements, whether they're phonemes, words, depend on repeated usage. And that's important here. The meaning of the signifiers that exist in differential relationships in language depends on their iterative usage. These signifiers have to be repeated and repeatable in order for them to sustain the meaning. Meaning is like momentum. And as soon as a signifier stops being used and repeated, like the language itself that it occupies, it goes dead. But that repetition is really important here. Meaning exists in a differential system, but it's only sustained iteratively. And so Lacan wants to have difference and repetition as foundational concepts in his thinking. Now, how this plays out at the level of the latest diagram that we've been developing is where we're going to turn next.